more options for new school buildings in Auburn City Schools. We have a facilities planning group made up of citizens in uh, our community that have been working for several months with Mr. Tracy Richter, uh, a facilitator. Uh, he's also the CEO of an educational planning firm. He'll also give information on project projected enrollment growth for Auburn City Schools over the next 10 years. Um, as a consultant, my job isn't to come here to tell the community of Auburn what you need to be doing. Um, I don't live here, I don't pay taxes here, no reason I should be telling you what to do. It's actually quite the opposite. It's driving this community in a direction that says, you know what, we need a roadmap. We need a direction that tells us what our next steps are going to be. We say, what do we really have to build to? And is a capital plan really about just bricks and sticks? Because folks, it's not. It's really about how you want to deliver education in the future and offer those opportunities to your students. So then, at York, of course, we're always updating the demographic analysis, looking at those projections out there. And then in 1314, this committee was formed, the people you met tonight, um, to talk about this and to start developing options. And so tonight, the goal here is really an information kind of data dump for you, is to see some of the data being used out there to make decisions. But almost more importantly, is to kind of baseline everybody in the same data. So the baseline data that we work from, if we're all starting from that same point, at least we've got that clear. So then we talk about the community feedback. If we do this tonight, you're going to see that this is a different kind of format. There's not a microphone sitting on a stand up here for people to come up and talk. But tonight, we're still in the data collection process where we take a written response and survey. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to feel, kind of feel out the community to see, you know, what is your tolerance for the roadmap? Where can we go? And that's what this process is about. So we took a look back a little bit. In 2006, this was the campus at Auburn High School. And, um, you know, it, we actually had some parking back then. And, um, you know, but things happen, things change, we grow. But if you looked at the school district back less than 10 years ago, you had a kindergarten center, your grades were 1 5, you had about you had five elementary schools, you were still working at middle junior high, and then you had high school, that the enrollment was about 1,100 kids. So, now we turn the clock, and then turn the clock out pretty quickly, and we see that the district now has grown 2,500 students. So, 50% growth in less than 10 years. Do you want to even venture to guess how many communities have done a 50% growth in their school enrollment in less than 10 years? It's not a whole lot, folks. This community didn't stand still. You continue to grow. You continue to be progressive. You continue to move forward. The result of that, then, was a vote in enrollment. And so, now think about that. So your reaction to that is that, okay, I get Richmond Elementary, I get Pick Elementary to address kind of that growth at the elementary grade level. Because I need seats for those kids, especially at that elementary school level. But folks, keep in mind that if you're going to have growth at an elementary school level, eventually those kids are going to be at the high school level. And I'm going to need some sort of accommodation for that because the growth is real. You've experienced it, you've seen it, you've reacted to it, you've reacted well to it. We added 500 kids to our high school enrollment. Think about that again, another 50% growth at the high school. Good thing you have a site with room, right? Um, so you had that growth going on. But we went back a little further, and we decided to look at, well, how many babies are being born here? Let's take a look at that. Now, if I look back last 10 years out there, I can see that, you know, in 2003, just to work, we're at that 400 level, 2002, 2000. Well, all of a sudden, in 2012, which is our latest statistical data, 620 children are being born in this community. So in the last 10 years, you've doubled your birth rate. Congratulations. <laughs> now, here's the thing about Auburn. And keep this in mind. For every 100 children that are born here, 108 show up. Now, that's not science fiction. That's nothing more than an attractive community that people want to be a part of. And so, how do you deal with an idea that you doubled your birth rate in 10 years? 
Not only that, but for every 100 kids, there's an extra eight showing up. And on top of that, as you progress through what we call a ratio, a cohort ratio of survival, you get more kids in second grade than you had in first grade. And then you get more kids in third grade than you had in second grade. So think about that kind of progression and what that means. And it can only mean that we need as you get older. So we see that. Okay, so what does that mean? This is the enrollment projection. And the enrollment projection, the numbers here aren't as critical as looking at the trend of color. And I'm going to stand out of the way a minute because the trend of color actually goes from green to red. And folks, the color red generally doesn't mean great things. It actually means some pressure point for us. Okay, and so as we look forward, you can see that when we did projections for the for the district and last year's projection, you know, we, we use several levels of projections. So we do a low projection, a moderate projection, a high projection, and then we also recommend one. And sometimes it's a blend of. So last year we went towards the moderate projection that was put out there, but the moderate projection hasn't been holding. So what we decided to do is look at that high projection. Look to see because of those birth rates, housing starts, everything that's going on in all. And that high projection, as you can see, starts to grow tremendously, even to a point in a 10-year projection, and you can see the numbers here. Again, it's another third of it, it's half the growth again. Always kind of, we're always updating projections. This district does a good job of updating annually to make sure we're on track. Now, what we also did was we also looked at the green group. We did again, if the visual of here is probably more important. Because as the lines go across in each cell, the more it fills, the more you're getting to the capacity of that grade level. And so you can see that those numbers that grow out there and those boxes that fill up, you start to see that growth occurring. I don't think anybody argues the fact that you're growing. Sometimes the argument falls in with how much you're growing. But again, the annual look at this is critical to making sure you're successful in the planning process. So, what we want to do is we want to compare. We want a comparison to say, okay, are we on track? When we started to look at the high projection, we were off about 1% about last year. Again, and then we start to look at, well, what is the number that's really messing with us? And folks, what we discovered was it was this kindergarten number that we actually undershot last year. So remember that 108 I just talked about? Last year it was more like 112 kids showed up. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but now progress those kids for 12 years. And so you review it, but even looking at the numbers here, you see the, the accuracy of the projection that will continue to run to make sure our data is good, our data is good, our data is good. So now let's look at the capacity buildings. So if I look at the capacity going across and I look at the elementary grade level, we've got about 4,500 seats out there. Now, 4,500 seats is put in every kid in every seat. Capacity and school size is independent of class size. School size does not influence class size necessarily. Keep that in mind. I can have a 2,000 student station high school with 40 kids in a classroom, and I can have a 100 student station class high school with 40 kids in a classroom. Now, what drives class size is more based around policy, it's based around budget, it's based around teacher contracts, it's based around a lot of those things. So don't let both those cloud you. So when you see a capacity that doesn't necessarily drive class size, the idea is to maintain a reasonable class size for your community that you can accept. But as I look at the capacity of the building, I know that I've got some room right now. If I look at the middle and junior highs, you know, I'm getting that pressure point a little bit. So I've got about, you know, 200 empty seats, maybe less than that. And even at the high school, though, I'm starting to press the limit. At 1,625 kids, the capacity of that building being just above 1,700. Now, also let me tell you something about capacity, because everything gets so complicated here. But here's the symbol of it, is that any high school principal will tell you that once a building gets to that 85% on paper, their building is probably pretty full. And the reason for that is that kids don't come in these nice, nice, nice packages of 22 or 25 and walk into a classroom as that. 
what happens is that you get an 18 calculus class and only can get 11 kids because the schedule doesn't allow anything to happen because they're in a fine arts class or they're scheduled for a language arts class, AP, or something else. And so we see our class size vary based on program delivery and the number of programs that you have. And so when you start to get a building about 85% of the high school level, folks, that's feeling full. It's not. And so you start to raise that utilization a little bit. The folks at 100%, that leaves very little flexibility for anything. And so you have to start creatively then looking at your building to say, how can I best squeeze this in? Well, I've met a few of you in Auburn, and just squeezing in your education isn't good enough. So we're trying to figure out, well, how do we do it better? So how are we going to meet those needs? So if I look in time, what we decided to do is we said, okay, let's just put it on a graph, capacity versus enrollment, and let's see from green to red, at what point do you reach your capacity? Three years at the elementary, one year at the six, seven, one year at eight, nine, and next year at the high school, you're there. The one year projection is going to be pretty accurate. And so that tells me that already at the high school level, I'm at my capacity. First of all, this is not just a high school issue. You are going to have a need for elementary seats in this district at some point. Now, whether those elementary seats come in additions or new buildings or you know, some other mode of expanding your capacity, there is an elementary thing going out there. And we can't ignore that. You've already been dealing with that. Okay, but then I start to look at this, and I think the number that gets out there is this 3,200 number at a high school. And eventually, this is kind of, besides, let's, just, let's not talk about funding yet, I know we'll talk about that at some point, but that's kind of the crux of this, is that when you look out and you think about Auburn City Schools, and you think about 3,200 kids, and then think about it on that campus. Now, Let's talk about school size then. I told you before that I don't have the luxury of a bias toward the big school, small school debate. Because folks, the debate is, is that they both actually work. Big schools can work and they work all across the country. Small, small schools can work and they work across the country. It's really dependent on the community you live in. One of the things that this community has to deal with is this idea of how big your high school is going to be and how big your comfort level with your high school is going to be. And so, tonight, we look at options. First thing is, these are options and not recommendations. Let's be very clear. If they were recommendations, so if there'd be one option, and if there's one option, it's not really an option because it's one. So these are options out there. Typically what starts to happen in something like this is that when you see multiple options out there, the community really starts to blend these things. It starts to say, well, you know what? That one really has some positive about it, but I really like this about the other option. And so what you start to see is this blend of things. Now, now ultimately, there's a cost in each of these. What I want you to focus on tonight is the option itself. You're going to see a cost on there, and that obviously will influence you. So as even when you're looking at each option, I want you to look at each option objectively. Now, options do not include land purchase dollars. Also, funding solutions have not been resolved. Now, we also know that. Again, I'm going to go back to the first step to that is creating the roadmap. And so let's get that map planned out, and then let's kind of figure out how, if, when, how long this thing will really take to get to where we need to get to. Finally, the cost do not include that $17 million of deferred maintenance I talked about and the deficiencies are out there. But we know they're there, so we don't ignore them. But that's not part of this discussion tonight because eventually we'll have to figure out a scheduled maintenance program, a scheduled deferred maintenance, and a, a, a scheduled replacement. And so there's a little bit of opportunity to look at a lot of different ways the district can look at the future. Now, the bottom of the sheet that has all of the numbers and the Excel chart in there. I just want to walk you through that really quick so we're clear on what it's telling us. Obviously, it's going to tell us the year that the action is to take place. Now, once again, this is highly dependent on funding. So the year is when they can, if we were to start today, we could do it. But obviously, that year can be pushed down. 
the second column is going to show us the action that's going to occur. Now, we show estimated cost, but then this is where I really want to explain is that you have an enrollment projection, a capacity, and a difference column. As this reads, is that that projection is a 10-year projection for that grade level. The estimated capacity based on that year, and when we add seats within that option, that number changes in that capacity and then shows the difference. So for instance, in option three, this is the elementary. What you have is that in year 1920, a new elementary school gets built of 600. It changes our capacity, which then again changes the difference of seats we have. So that's the logical flow of how the enrollment to the capacity works. Anytime you add capacity, it's bolded and underlined. So you can see when that change is made and then the difference. And you'll see this at every grade level. So let's start with option one. Now you have a couple of ways to tell you what's going on. So you've got a map, you've got a block thing for anybody that's visual out there. But the summary of option one is this. The grade configuration would be K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. Now this is more of a traditional kind of grade configuration setting. Um, I'm, the estimate, uh, there's about 75% of school districts across the country this grade configuration. Okay, so it's a pretty common type of grade configuration. Now, a common question asked, does that mean we get away from K2, 3, 5? No. Okay, we still have the flexibility to stay K2, 3, 5. We know that it's going very well with a lot of community members out there. They like that concept. This is a two high school option. It looks at two six through eight grade middle schools. They're traditional middle schools. And then nine K-5 elementary schools. You're currently at eight. And so thinking about that grade split with nine schools actually becomes a challenge also. I want to make you aware of that because we're trying to be as transparent as we can be. Now, here's the actions for option one. Again, the year is going to be really dependent on funding, but this is if we could start. That new construction high school would be on a new north site. That site is to be determined. We don't have a site. Um, the start capacity of that building would be 1,600. So basically the size of your high school today. Okay, now, in 2020, we would actually raise the capacity in this to 2,200 because keep in mind we got ninth grade coming in now. And so we're looking at a high school kind of population of north of 4,000. If this makes it easy, and this is what's kind of made it easy on the steering committee, if you think in the future at about 12,500 kids, think about 1,000 kids at each grade level. 1,000 kids at each grade level. That makes it pretty simple because that's about the number. Okay, so that means 4,000 kids there, so you're going to need that, that 2,000, 2,200 seats at each of the schools. This would then make a conversion of Drake and Auburn Junior High to the middle schools. Now, this is also going to require, though, what we add capacity to those buildings through additions. And again, on, you've seen those sites, sometimes that's a challenge. But capacity addition means a lot of different things. We've seen, we've seen big cafeterias and kitchens kind of stripped out bare and made classrooms and build a new cafeteria because it was easier to do it that. They added capacity doing that. So there's all kinds of different ways to add capacity to a building. In 2020, then would renovate the existing Auburn High School and then put a 400 capacity addition on. The thought behind this is, is that probably looking at the cost would include maybe getting rid of those nice, beautiful buildings in the middle of your campus and replacing those with 21st century learning environments and adding 400 capacity. But again, think about the site as it is. And then would actually add a new athletic complex for Auburn High School at the new Sanford site down the road. Now, another point of clarification. Two high schools means two comprehensive high schools. It means two athletic programs, two special ed needs, two academic teams, two, they are clearly delineated schools. We had a lot of questions last night. Does that mean we still get one team? But this option means two high schools. They are both still, I guess, 70 now at that size. You guys just change your once again, so they're still both 7A schools. So both still competing at that level for, and when I think about competition, I don't think about just athletics, I think about marching bands, I think about academic teams, 
All of those are on a competitive level when you're talking about classes. Okay, so that puts that there. And then you have, obviously you see the cost. We break down the cost to see you know, what's going out there. These costs are based on best practices, current construction dollars locally in the state of Alabama to make sure we're as accurate as we can be, and then even projecting out some inflation in time. Also keeping in mind that this state is gonna become very competitive in the high school building market pretty soon. Huntsville City Schools is going through two new high schools. Um, Decatur's looking at two new high schools. Birmingham and some of those suburbs are looking at new high schools. Folks, there's a lot of, I don't know, there's a high school bug going on in the state. But a lot of people are looking at this, which means there's a real competition to make sure that we get the right, you know, we get the right materials, the right contractors, all of those kind of things. Option two is still a two high school concept. Now this option though, Vary because what this suggests is to build two new high schools. Build them at the same time. Come out of the blocks at the same time to make sure that we have buildings that are the same age always. Now, remember when I talked about the educational specifications and standards. We did that for a reason. We did that regardless if you were going to stay at one high school or two high schools. But what you know is that you have equitable facilities. That a science room at one high school will look the same as a science room in the next high school. Performance, fine arts, all of those will be of equal standard. Will they look the same? Probably not. Do you want them to look the same? Maybe, maybe not. That's some decisions you have to make down the road. I'll let you guys deal with naming rights. Nobody likes to do that. And again, like I told the crowd last night, PS1, PS2 doesn't sound bad at time. So, thinking about all of those, but it's too new right out of the gate. Both at 1600 to start because that needs that projection. Now, but as always, you design schools so they can expand. Make sure that you're building the course, which means lunchrooms, administration, all of the support spaces so you can expand the building. But you start at 1600, which is right at where you're at now. And so that'd be the same. Then we'd look at 1 8th, 9th junior high, which would be at the existing Auburn High School. And again, how you deal with that, how you get students there, and how you want to, how you manage that, because you're going on to a high school campus, you, you know, that's an operational thing. And then we're looking at two sixth and seventh middle schools at Auburn Junior High and Drake. Now, once again, as far as the grade configuration go, we talk a lot about, okay, is it one sixth grade, is it one seventh grade, or is it a combination sixth, seventh grade? We can do both of this. Okay, well, we'll do some more exploration about what fits best, both for facilities and, most importantly, what best fits in the curriculum. That vertical line of curriculum is going to be critical. We're still looking at a new elementary school to make it 9K5 um, elementary school. The process of this would be right out of the gate doing, you actually start by building the schools at 1200 because that's all you need right away. So that keeps the cost down a little bit, but in five years, turning this around to add addition, additional seats. So again, just planning to make sure you put an, an education wing on to get the buildings to their final capacity. Then to replace, um, you would actually replace Auburn High School on the new Sanford site that's our, that you already have. So you can go over there, and then the same the same thing happens there. Build a 1,200 added capacity. Then locate the school, the junior high, 89 junior high at Auburn, looking at a 400 seat addition then in time, and then converting, making the conversion of Drake and Auburn junior high at then 2019, the elementary school. And so you see there's a variation here because both new high schools and a two high school option. Now, option three is a one high school option, but what you're gonna notice is that beyond the high schools, this option is identical to option two. The only difference is, is this builds replaces Auburn High School on the new site for 3,200 students. Okay, so again, the, the, so you're gonna stay in a K5, 6, 7, 8, 9 grade configuration, a 10, 12 grade configuration. And again, you vary up the elementary if you want to, and you continue to do that. But in the process, as you replace Auburn High School right out of the gate, you put the starting capacity at 2,400, because remember those two 1,200s together. 
and then you add that 800 capacity addition in time. Now, but also keep in mind, and again, I want to be as completely open and honest about this as possible, is that buys you 10 years. That gets you at your 3200 projection. Okay? And so, so you got to figure out what you do after that, and then whether it's educational, whether it's more capital, whatever it is. You locate the 8-9 at Auburn High School, you convert the Drake and Auburn Junior High, and you build the elementary school. But the cost of that last option, 139.875, and guess what? The cost is eerily similar. Because it is. Now, the additional cost that we have to think about in that other option is land. Because remember, we did not include that cost in that. Okay, so keep that, just kind of keep that in the back of your head when you're going through these options. Now, finally, the last option, which really is kind of proving, is kind of proving that what we wanted to do is we really wanted to kick over every stone to see what real options were out there. So, this one is predicated on changing the grade configuration to a K-6, then a 7-8 with a ninth grade center, and then a 10-12 high school. Now, Figuring on the sixth grade moving back down to elementary school, this one suggests that we do renovations and, and additions to Auburn High School. That on the new Sanford site, the first thing you do is that you build a technology and career center. Now, little information about technology and career centers. They're not the old vocational schools we talked about. They're not those kind of things, although they can include those things. But technology and career centers in the future are very inclusive of today's curriculum, trying to integrate core curriculum into that. There are anything from those professional biosciences all the way to, to continuing those certification programs of welders, plumbers. All of those things that prepare our children for careers. But what the idea here is, is that you would build a ninth grade center on this site also which we think is provide some flexibility to eventually, if you wanted this to be your primary high school site, it could be. Because all you do then is take the career center and envelop it into the ninth grade center and then build the rest of the seats you need. Now, a cost advantage to this is a career center is a little less expensive coming out of the gate because career centers don't need football fields, they don't need theaters, they don't need gyms. High dollar, big base space. And so that's kind of an advantage of that. Now, what this also suggests, though, is in that K-6 grade configuration, you're going to need more elementary seats. So the first thing we talked about was building kind of a larger elementary, and not necessarily 1,200, but building two 600 small schools on the same site. Shared land, shared resources, you know, shared um, mechanical, all those kind of things that can build efficiency, less money, same services but also then adding another um, elementary school, which would then take you to 11 elementary school. Now, the cost of that actually grows quite a bit. So that's our largest co cost option. But folks, it also is an option that has a lot of moving parts. Now keep in mind, you have a, you have a career technical program at the current high school. You have a great culinary arts space if you've never seen it. And so, just trying to expand on that a little bit, but that price tag ultimately, and mostly because of those elementary seats, start to add up. I want you to look at those options objectively. You're going to be asked several questions. Those questions are going to vary from how do you feel about that option to them ranking those options in order. There's a, on the right hand side in red letters, you're going to see that there's the uh, presentation tonight, in case you want to go through this revenue thing again. And then you also have the, um, the options packets in there, so you can review them again online and see them in full color. And then there's a questionnaire that you can answer online. 